You ready? Mm -hmm. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you guys are having a great Tuesday so far. Uh, we, we have a lot of great stuff to talk to you about today. I would like to first introduce myself. My name is Nick Dusick. I am the Senior Government Affairs Associate at Child Care Aware of America. And hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Nove McCready. I'm the Director of Policy here at Child Care Aware of America. And we would like to take this chance to, first off, welcome you to the first of our four-part CCBBG Moving Forward webinar series. Uh, you'll, as I said, this is the first part. There will be uh, three follow-up webinars digging into things like uh, what, what's going on and what families and providers will need to know, uh, what child care resource and referral agencies will need to know, and a little bit more of the logistical side of it, which is everybody's favorite, around uh, budget appropriations and implementation timeline for the last one. But for this one, uh, we're going to make sure you guys have a nice overview of everything that's happened to date, give you guys a nice background on the program itself, and we're going to move into a little bit about what's in the legislation, what are some things that if you're having conversations in your state or with uh, early childhood advocates or, you know, you're, you're just interested in learning more, what, what are the good starting points for conversations for you to be uh, aware of? Yeah, and as Nick said, we are very excited to have you all today. And um, if you are having, if you have a question or any comments, make sure that you, um, I wanted to point your attention to the chat box. Um, it's on the um, left side or the right side of your computer. You, throughout the presentation, we will have Q&A at the end, um, but feel free throughout to type in questions um, that come up while they're uh, uh, top of mind for you, and we'll make sure to, to carve out some time at the end to answer them. And, and one question I do want to answer before we move forward, uh, one thing that I think we always get is uh, whether or not these slides will be made available or whether or not this presentation will be made available. Uh, both the slides and a link to the YouTube channel where you can find this recording will be on the webinar page where you found the link for the, to register for this webinar. Um, so it, when you registered, there is a list of the four. If you're looking for the next webinars or the slides from this one or the YouTube link, it can all be found there. So before we start, I did want to make a note uh, of something very important. It, it's that the CCDBG Moving Forward webinar series is designed to provide an introduction into the amended version of S-1086, uh, the Child Care and Development Block Grant Act of 2014, and what, if passed, those in the states will, be, will need to be made aware of. In addition to awaiting final passage of the bill by the Senate and the President's signature to become law, the Department of Health and Human Services will then be responsible for providing guidelines for implementation that could alter some of what's discussed during the series. Uh, as I said in the introduction, we want to make sure that this is a good start for, um, you know, some of the introductions around what's in it, what's happened, how did we get to this point, and what are some things that might be in it, uh, if it passes and you should be aware of. But I do want to make a note that things could change based on what guidance uh, HHS gives if the bill's passed, or there is always the possibility that the bill doesn't pass and uh, other changes happen through the federal rulemaking process. Okay, thanks so much, Nick. <clears throat> so before we get started, I wanted to um, give you all an overview of who we are at Child Care Aware of America. Um, we are the nation's leading voice for child care, and our mission is to support the development of an effective child care system to support the healthy development of all children. And uh, since 1987, Child Care Aware of America has been working to improve the system of early learning for children uh, through several different ways. Uh, one is providing training, resources, and sharing best practices and standards to local and state child care resource and referral agencies to support high quality and accountable service services. Um, a second uh, mission of ours is promoting national policies and partnerships that facilitate universal access to high-quality childcare 
and collecting, analyzing, and reporting on current child care data and research, including uh, child care supply demands and trends that we see and are experiencing in the nation. Um, and then also, we strive here at Child Care Aware of America to offer <clears throat> child care and parenting information and resources to families and connect those families with our many local child care resource and referral agencies that are located in your communities. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and let me <clears throat> talk a little bit about the child care landscape before we begin. So we hear a lot about the several different uh, patchwork of federal programs that are out there, but in reality, there are only a few major um, ones that are core to the early learning system that I wanted to talk about um, today to give you a full understanding of what the landscape looks like. Um, they reach, these different systems reach children and families in different places at home or in organized programs, and they meet different needs for children and families. Uh, plus development um, and parents' needs and at different times in the child care or the early childhood uh, life. So the first one is what we'll be focusing on today, which is the child care system. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how many children and what the child care system looks like in a minute. Um, the second is home visiting or maternal and infant early childhood home visiting, which supports pregnant women. Um, through birth to five and through a variety of services and primarily in the home. <clears throat> There's also the early Head Start, which is typically zero to three-year-olds and through um, Head Start services. Um, and then also we're looking at, when we're looking at a birth to five continuum, we also um, want to think about state-funded pre-K, which is also part of uh, the bigger child care landscape. And again, child care does continue after a child is five, but these are the major core components of the early child care system. So what does that, what does that um, the statistics behind uh, the early core components look like? So right now, um, nearly 15 million children of working parents are in some type of child care arrangement, and they spend about, uh, about average 36 hours a week in this child care. And about 11 million of those children are under the age of five years old. At least one in four families piece together their child care and are placed in multiple arrangements. So that could be uh, maybe it, it would look like an early Head Start program in the morning and with a grandparent or a parent or a family friend and neighbor in the afternoon. Um, but we do know that out of the four families that utilize the child care system, one in four of them have multiple different placements for their children. And another fact about the child care system is that almost 60% of the cost of child care is assumed by the parents, uh, which uh, on average is about 30% of uh, the monthly budget of that family. So that's more than rent, utilities, transportation, and food. And in 31 states, plus the District of Columbia, more than the price of college tuition compared to infant care for their, um, for their youngest. So uh, just to put a little plug in, on December 4th, we will be releasing our child care, uh, parents and high cost of child care report that really digs deeper into what's behind this uh, cost of child care phenomenon. So the Child Care and Development Block Grant Program, or what we will be referencing a lot on this uh, webinar is CCDBG, is the primary federal grant program that provides child care assistance for families and funds many different child care quality initiatives. So it was originally signed into law in 1990. And the last reauthorization happened in 1996 as part of welfare reform. And really what happens is states have great latitude and flexibility in implementation of these policies. So they really set the framework in their state for um, what's happening behind the law. And I did want to point out a couple of different things. Again, we're talking about um, the law, not the proposed bill that I will turn it over to Nick to talk about more in depth. But in the current CCDBG law, 
Um, one, it does not require comprehensive or background checks for child care providers. Two, it does not contain any minimum training requirements currently. Um, three, it does not require ongoing or regular inspections. And the third is it does not require minimum protections, um, health safety protections for um, children that are in child care programs and are receiving federal assistance. And in order to understand the child care landscape, it's, it's important to understand where the funds come from and what makes it up. Um, there's several different funding streams for child care programs, and um, it can get a little bit tricky. And also, states have many different names for these funding streams. And so you may be familiar with the Child Care Development Fund in your state, or um, Child Care Development Block Grant assistance, or federal child care subsidies. Um, so definitely, I wanted to talk a little bit about what comprises the funding streams for, for child care. So the Child Care Development Fund is a big pot of money, which consists of, <clears throat> first, the money of the Child Care Development Block Grant, then plus uh, the child care entitlement to states, which is primarily the mandatory funding for child care. Then you also are adding the temporary assistance to needy families transfers that happen in each state um, towards the Child Care Development Block Grant Fund. So if you combined all these CCDF funding streams, they're consolidated each at the state level and administrated, administered under the, um, the Child Care Development Block Grant Act rules. <clears throat> so what do these totals look like? For discretionary funding as of FY 2014 for Child Care Development Block Grant, it's $2.36 billion, and that discretionary money is um, implemented through an appropriations bill on a yearly basis. And the mandatory child care funding in FY 2014 was around $2.917 billion. And mandatory funding is on certain programs required by an existing law. OK, now I want to talk a little bit about some snapshots of how we got to where we are with the child care system. Um, these are major pieces of um, legislation or happenings that um, led us to where we are today. And before I hand it over to Nick to talk about the exciting year that we've had with child care, um, I wanted to back up a little bit and go through some uh, major pieces of legislation that uh, occurred. <clears throat> the first is the Lanham Act of 1940. And between 1943 and 1946, the U.S. had a child care system in place, and that was designed to increase participation of mothers in the workforce. And this actually served over 500,000 children um, through federal, federal government, and it provided about two-thirds of the funding the federal government did. And then communities were expected to absorb the rest of that. And um, obviously, that was a program to support um, mothers entering the workforce during the war. But it actually ended during the uh, World War II, when the war ended in World War II. <clears throat> and uh, even though the war, war ended, uh, mothers were still in the workforce. Um, the next major piece of legislation that was actually vetoed in 1971 was by President, and it was vetoed by President Nixon, was a Comprehensive Child Care Development Act, and it was sponsored by two different senators, which was passed earlier in the year by the Senate, but Nixon actually vetoed um, what the bill would do, which was establish a nationally funded and locally administered comprehensive child care system. And um, it would provide quality early education, nutrition, and medical services. So that was um, vetoed in 1971. And then in 1990, I mentioned earlier that the first authorization of the Child Care Development Block Grant happened. And one of the three major streams, and you may be familiar with it as the um, Aid for Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, was the largest. Um, and in 1996, we are all familiar with what happened, which was the welfare reform under um, President Bill Clinton with the signing of the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. The three programs that had provided the funds to families and child care assistance, including what I mentioned before, the AFDC, 
were now merged into one program. And under that, the Child Care Development Block Grant Program was established and um, is still going as we know it. So uh, before, uh, I'll click here and hand it over to talk for Nick to tell you about um, what's been happening as of late. So over the past few years, there has been a lot of exciting movement in uh, Washington, D.C. on the federal level around child care uh, improvement policy. And probably the biggest development has been the introduction and movement of the Child Care and Development Block Grant Act of then 2013, now 2014, which was originally introduced in June of last year. Uh, it was originally sponsored by four senators, Senator Barbara Mikulski, a Democrat from Maryland, Senator Richard Burr, a Republican from North Carolina, Senator Tom Harkin, a Democrat from Iowa, and Senator Lamar Alexander, a Republican from Tennessee. Uh, some of the things that were included in that were some of the very basic health and safety pieces, uh, such as conducting comprehensive background checks, inspections of programs prior to licensing and once annually, uh, the implementation and development of professional uh, training standards as part of the licensing, uh, the raising of quality set-aside funds, so uh, money set aside to go specifically towards quality improvement activities, uh, raising the eligibility period for uh, redetermination for uh, families up to 12 months, which some states were only at six months, and developing a national toll-free hotline and website for referrals, quality information, and consumer complaints. So before I move forward, I, I, I want to talk about a little bit about how we got to this point. Michelle gave a great overview of the history, you know, the past few decades and, and leading back through uh, World War II. But I want to talk about the past couple years and, and how we got to this point legislatively. Uh, and if, if you haven't been um, living and breathing, you know, what's, what's been happening in Congress as uh, we, we get to do here, um, it should be a nice little overview of what's happened the past few years. So as I mentioned, it was uh, the Child Care and Development Block Grant Act of 2013 was introduced in, uh, in June of 2013. Only a few months later in September, the Senate Health, Education, and Labor, Labor and Pensions Committee passed out uh, the bill by unanimous consent doing a vo voice vote. So they basically said, does everybody agree with this? Great. And it passed through the committee, uh, which meant that the next step for it was going to the full Senate floor, which it did on March 12th. So March 12th of 2014, the Senate took it up for debate. And, and spent two days going over uh, the bill and debating it and actually adopted 18 different amendments uh, after about 50 or so were proposed. Uh, when they took the final vote on it on March 13th, it passed by a total of 96 to 2. Uh, e even if you're not a congressional expert, or even if you are, um, a, a 96 to 2 margin for a vote is pretty significant. And it really did signal how important and non-controversial this bill was in a bipartisan way. Um, so it was a great kind of uh, foreshadowing for moving forward. It, only a few weeks later, uh, the House Education and the Workforce Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Elementary, and Secondary Education held a hearing called the Foundation for Success, Strengthening the Child Care and Development Block Grant Program. This hearing was chaired by uh, Representative Todd Rokita from Indiana and talked a lot about you know, what the House felt about the Senate bill, as well as, you know, wh what issues are with the program, how does the program work. It was a really good insight for the House on how to move forward. Uh, in, in early September, w we actually had the opportunity to host a congressional briefing, briefing sponsored by both the uh, House committee leadership in both parties um, to talk a little bit about this, which built on that. And then only a few days later, uh, leaders from both the House and the Senate announced a bipartisan bicameral agreement on CCDBG. So over the past few months, uh, the Senate and House had been negotiating an agreement to see if they could come together to get something um, that both the House and the Senate could agree on that would be a uh, pretty straightforward bill and should have a pretty high percentage chance of passing. Well, only three days later, the uh, bill, the amended bill went to the House floor and passed by, once again, a voice vote of them basically all agreeing to it without any dissension. 
Well, what happened was shortly after that, it went to the Senate uh, and, and went through a little bit of a uh, process which isn't as well known in the Senate and not exactly what most would consider transparent, called the hotline process, where uh, both the majority leader of the Senate and the minority leader of the Senate placed calls to each to members of their caucus, letting them know that a bill is up for consideration. If nobody places a hold or objection on that bill, the bill will move forward and then be voted on through unanimous consent at the end of that day's business. Um, unfortunately for passage of the bill, there were two senators, uh, Senator Tom Coburn and Senator Pat Toomey, who placed a hold or objection on the bill, um, which meant that the progress had to stop. So instead of taking it through the unanimous consent process, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid uh, from Nevada scheduled the bill for a closure vote when they returned, when the Senate returned for business in uh, early to mid-November. At the same time, he also did what's called filling the amendment tree, which means it will be unlikely that any senator will be able to add amendments to the bill meaning that when they get back in November, there should be an easy two-vote step to what we hope is passage, uh, at which point it will go to the president's desk for his signature, and then the enactment and implementation process starts with the Department of Health and Human Services gaining responsibility for guidance and implementation of the bill. Um, so I can talk about more about that if you have questions about that. But this, you know, just kind of provides a general timeline as far as what's happened over the past two years. Uh, and, you know, at this point, I think what I'm going to do is start going into a little bit more about what's actually in it and what should, when you're having conversations or when you're talking or what, you know, when you're thinking about it, should you really need to know that's a piece of it. So, as I mentioned, in the amended version of S-1086, uh, which is probably the most common way that this bill is referred to. Uh, one of the big pieces was that it included comprehensive background checks for all providers receiving CCDBG funds. Um, so uh, what, what is a comprehensive background check? Something we're, off, we're asked often. It, it actually uh, is composed of five different pieces. You have a, finger, a state and federal fingerprint check. You have a federal name check. You have a check of the sex offender registry and a check of the child abuse registry. So that's a big step for um, making sure that, you know, that, that providers have some basic checks as far as um, backgrounds are concerned. Another big piece is pre-licensing and annual inspection. So this is a good way for uh, states to make sure that providers are complying with the new standards that are out there for, for health and safety. So um, there's a lot of big health and safety pieces that are going to be put into place. Um, and all this means is once a year, you'll, you'll have an inspector come out and, you know, go over a program based on a set of, uh, on a set of um, formulas that they have to look at for each uh, program based on what each state defines. Each, each state will have the flexibility to define what they want for licensing within the federal guidelines. Uh, and they'll have to do that before a program is licensed as well as once each year. Another big piece of the amended bill um, is that it includes monitoring for license exempt programs. So previously, under current law, states have the ability to exempt a uh, provider from licensing. Uh, the most common use of this in states is for faith-based providers. Um, so what, what they wanted to do was ensure that they, you know, allowed states to continue to have that flexibility to exempt providers from licensing but provided them an opportunity to at least ensure that there's the health and safety uh, of children in those programs, at least the ones who are receiving federal funding to be in those programs, are protected. So all the, this is making sure is that the program comp complies with basic fire health and safety standards. Uh, so it's definitely a little bit less than what a fully licensed program would receive, uh, but it's at least one way to ensure um, that they're, they're getting it to, uh, you know, at least the basic level. And, and one thing I do want to mention, and I think this is very important, is for licensing exempt programs, the monitoring will not include uh, family, friend, and neighbor care. Th this is primarily for, um, you know, programs that receive money for this beyond um, 
family, friend, and neighbor care. I, another big piece of it is training standards. So what, one of the things that um, a lot of states already do is have a set of training standards in place for providers um, that they need to ensure they have before they care for children, as well as on an ongoing basis to ensure that they're, you know, making sure they're um, providing quality care and, you know, the most up-to-date care based on what research is out there and doing what's best for the uh, children and themselves. So this puts into place uh, a requirement that providers must have a certain number of topics uh, covered as part of their training as well as ensuring that states set minimum hours that uh, providers must be trained. Although it allows states to set the flexibility um, for what that number is, so you know it does give states a lot of room to say, well, we don't want many hours, so we're going to keep it low, or we want to make sure providers are going to quite a bit of training. So it still gives states a decent amount of flexibility on that. And then the last, an another big health and safety piece, and. I, I want to be very clear, these are far from the only things in the bill around health and safety. Uh, a good portion of S-1086 is focused on improving health and safety standards in child care um, and child care programs receiving federal funds. But a big piece is the quality set aside, uh, which I'll actually talk a little bit more in depth about now. So current law provides or requires that each state dedicate at least 4% of CCDBG funds to be used to improve the quality of child care. This means that states, out of all of the money they spend on child care, must spend at least 4% doing activities that improve the quality of care. Uh, th this definition it varies by state. Some use it on things like ensuring that child care resource and referral services are provided to make sure families can find uh, child care in their area. Other states use it for uh, providing professional development for providers to make sure they can provide that foundation for care. Um, and it really uh, changes based on what each state values. I, I, and under uh, the amended version of S-1086, it actually changes that 4% over time and very gradually from 7% in the first two fiscal, first full fiscal years after enactment all the way up to 9% by the fifth full fiscal year. So you, what you see is 7% in years one and two, 8% in years three and four, and then 9% for years five and beyond. This is a uh, pretty significant change as it really makes sure that, ensures that states are focusing on quality as part of their uh, child care spending. As part of that, in the, after the second full fiscal year of enactment, states must also ensure that they're spending an additional 3% for that year and each year beyond on activities to improve the care uh, or the quality of care for infants and toddlers specifically. So in addition to all the other 9% um, by the end of year five, you're looking at an additional 3% on top of that for infant and toddler quality care. So you're looking at 12% by uh, the end of the fifth, fifth full fiscal year for quality improvement activities. So, you know, we always, get asked about what other uh, big pieces do we want to highlight in this. And, and one of the big things uh, we talk about a lot is consumer education. Um, you, you know, when they were passing um, CCDBG out of the House, one, one of the things that most concerned members and most excited them about this bill and the passion they shared for it was that they believed the focus on supporting parental choice for uh, child care. What we know is that a lot of families still have trouble finding and differentiating between what care is available for them, what they can do to it. Uh, and that's a big part of what our, our members, child care research and referral agencies, do in the state. Um, so one of the big things that was focused on in S1086 was improving consumer education to make for sure that families are getting the best information out there and getting information that's clear to them in a meaningful way for any family to be able to pick up and say, I think this makes sense, this provider does this, this, and this, or they don't do this and this, they have this kind of qualification, uh, so we like them. So it really you know, was focused on making sure provide, or families had the best choices, had the best information available to make an informed choice. So some of the stuff that was included in S1086 
uh, was a, an allowance out of the quality set aside uh, and from the quality improvement activities allowed, allowed states to develop, implement, or enhance tiered rating systems for providers. So currently there are 39 states that have implemented uh, or have developed a quality rating and improvement system, which is the most commonly uh, common form of a tiered rating system. To and, and most states are either in development of them or are working on developing one. Um, that basically sets forward a list of quality indicators that are used to rate or judge providers uh, in a way that you would see similar to Yelp or uh, Urban Spoon or TripAdvisor or any of your favorite rating websites. That helps parents understand that you know, they look at a provider, they know whether or not this provider is going above and beyond the call and meeting all of the quality criteria or trying to, or if they still have some room to go on that. And, and that information really does help parents, uh, families see the entire picture of what's going on. Another big thing uh, is that after two years, after the state comes into compliance with the uh, inspection piece of the bill, uh, one year after that, they have to start posting all of their inspection reports electronically. So if I'm a family looking to choose childcare, this is something that I want to know if the program I'm thinking about choosing, whether or not I receive funding, that as long as that program has been inspected, that report will be posted electronically uh, online. And it will be up to the states to decide where and uh, how easy that information is to access for families, but it will be publicly available information, and it will have a very straightforward manner for which families can actually understand what the infection reports say. Uh, and, and another big piece is it would require the operation of a national toll-free hotline and website to help parents access information about child care. Um, so a national toll-free hotline already exists to help, and it helps families uh, direct them to the local child care resource and referral agencies. But this would include, uh, you know, expanding upon that to provide a localized list of eligible providers. So if I'm looking at it, I'd be able to type in my address, my zip code, and pull up at least the list of eligible providers, which ones accept subsidy and which ones do not in my area. It would include provider-specific information from the QRIS. So if a provider does participate in QRIS, what have they been rated on? What could they be doing better? That information would be included as well as licensing compliance information. Um, so if there's anything that that provider is in compliance with or out of compliance with, that information could be listed there, as well as referrals to the local PCRNRs for more information. So if you're looking for child care and you see all that, but maybe it doesn't, it's not clear, it doesn't uh, state it well, or maybe it does and you want to double check it or get greater information, it would provide you, uh, a, you know, access to the local experts in your uh, community, the people who, you know, talk with not only providers but families on a daily basis around child care. So it makes sure you would have <coughs> direct access to them as well. And lastly, another big piece it would provide on that hotline and website would be state information about subsidy and related programs. So it would, talk, it would provide information around, you know, maybe I'm not a – or maybe I'm not currently a, um, a, a somebody signed up for the L, uh, subsidy program in my state or community because I didn't know about it, but I happened to find this website and I was interested in learning more. It would provide a link uh, and you know materials and resources for you to learn more, as well as what other programs you may be eligible for. And once again, that's something that the local CCRNRs can also help with uh, when they're talking with you about that. So. As I said, there's, there's quite a bit in this bill. Uh, one of the other things I'm going to focus on is, you know, some of the other big pieces that have been talked about a lot. As I said, this is not a completely comprehensive list because the bill is almost 90 pages and has quite a bit of uh, significant changes. But I did want to highlight four more things uh, before we move on. One of the big pieces was that states would need to set redetermination periods for eligibility at 12 months. So what this means is that if you're a family receiving subsidy, you would not have to worry about redetermining your eligibility every six months as some states currently require. So 
in some states, if your family, uh, as many of you know, it's very difficult for families to not only get the paperwork together, but get the time off or have the process and know the process in place to redetermine their eligibility for subsidy assistance. This gives them a little bit more of a leeway and allows them to not have to worry about it. What that does and what that really impacts is continuity of care. And that's important um, in our opinion for two main reasons. Continuity of care has found to be a, a crucial factor in the continued development of children in a healthy manner by allowing them to stay with one provider in one area and not have to go back and forth between different programs, different providers, different types of care. Additionally, it allows families to actually create a plan in place for themselves to know that if they qualify for care for a year, they're not going to have to worry about what happens if they get kicked off of it or what happens uh, for their own. So it allows them to set up more stability in their work-life balance. Another piece on top of that is it would require states to explain how they're going to account for work and income fluctuations of families. So and currently under uh, most states' current law, and like I said, in the state, they require um, families to either self-report or they require families to lose assistance if certain changes in um, income or work happen to affect that family's eligibility for subsidy. One of the more common um, definitions or examples of this that we hear about is what's called the cliff effect, which basically means somebody qualified for a subsidy and had been on a subsidy but they got a slight income bump from either a promotion or a, an additional job, which actually caused them to lose their eligibility for subsidy and would be kicked off the program and, in effect, actually be in a worse off position because then they would be fully responsible for the cost of care. Uh, so this would help states at least provide some accountability for families to be more flexible around well, what are they doing to make sure that doesn't happen or make sure that effect is lessened? Another big thing that was talked about was s and &E 6 would allow states to designate or establish a valid market rate survey, which already happens every two years, or an alternative methodology such as a cost estimation model to set reimbursement rates. All this means is that every year um, since 1996, states have been setting, uh, have had to conduct a market rate survey, which basically says, well, how much should child care cost in a community? What is the market rate for a child care uh, slot in a community? What this does is help understand a little bit better, or allow states to possibly use a different methodology to say, well, maybe that, that may be what the market rate is actually of that, but what's the actual cost that parent or family is paying for access to a child care program? Uh, so this actually may, you know, it's it's all based on what states could do. States could move forward with the market rate survey as is and nothing could change. But some states, as have already tried, could use an alternative methodology. It would have to be approved by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to set a new study or method to uh, maybe get a better picture of what's actually going on in the state. And lastly, another big thing is they would delink provider reimbursement rates from unforeseen absences. So one thing we've seen a lot of problems in states is that um, there's a lot of issues with something happens where a kid, ch child has to miss, you know, so many dates a year, but they have already used up their allotted uh, amount of absent days. And what that happens is once they hit that day, if they're on subsidy, the state may go into effect where they don't reimburse the provider or the family for that rate. And in effect, what happens is the provider loses the ability to have a stable program or stable funding stream that they were counting on. Um, and in effect, what we see is the provider is being hurt by that. And, you know, there, there's some resistance in the past anecdotally that providers are less likely to work with subsidy children in states that have um, strict reimbursement and absent day tied policies together uh, as a result, as a direct result of that. Uh, the last thing I really wanted to talk about was the bill. As I said, there's a, a while we could spend on this. We're having four webinars on this for a reason. 
Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and we could probably go into a much greater depth uh, in many, many more webinars. And you'll see a lot of resources coming out from Child Care Aware of America over the next few months around this. But one thing I want to talk about before we move into the uh, question and answer and discussion portion of the webinar is what, what did it set for funding, and what does that even mean? Uh, so S1086 would set authorization levels for fiscal years 2015 through 2020, providing a baseline for appropriations for program funding. Uh, so we would tie 2015, fiscal year 2015, which starts October 1st of this year, 2014, through uh, FY 2020, which would set it at uh, $2.749 billion. So what, what is this and what does it mean and why is it important? This is the discretionary level that would provide a baseline for the appropriators, which is a whole uh, tied process. Every year, the House and Senate Appropriations Committee must come to an agreement on 12 different funding bills to fund the government. If they cannot do that, you saw something that happened last year, like a uh, government shutdown. But typically what happens is they can either come to an agreement on a continuing resolution to fund the government on a short-term basis, or they provide funding bills which provide it for that year's fiscal funding. Uh, and they, these are stuff, these are pieces and programs that have to be funded each year. So when it's a discretionary program, they have to appropriate new funds every year. Uh, for CCDBG, the authorization for funding actually expired in 2002. What that means is since 2002, the funds have been appropriated, but there's been no authorization to do that. So they've been doing it without an authorization. These numbers just provide a baseline. They can provide higher figures among beyond this, but they can't provide anything lower than these numbers uh, through these years for discretionary funding. One thing I do want to note before we move on to the question portion is that in March of 2014, the Congressional Budget Office, the agency that scores or gives a the whole estimate for how much each bill would cost to implement, provided an estimate of $13.1 billion over these years to implement this bill. Well, when they came out with the most recent estimate, they came out with a number of $12.0 billion, which is simply a sum of the uh, authorization amount. So what you see is a $1.1 billion gap, which only shows what was in the bill in March, and there have been additional changes since then. So it's really hard when you're looking at this to get a good number of what's going on or a good figure of what's going on funding-wise, and we won't really have a clear picture until we start really moving forward into the implementation a little bit more. So I, I hope all of that was helpful. I, I understand it's a lot of information. But at this point, we really want to open up and um, take some questions for you guys. We, we know there's probably a lot of questions. I also will say I know we probably won't get to all of them. We have about 15 more minutes uh, that we can answer questions. Um, so I'm going to start going through some of the questions and see if um, See, see what you guys have. So if you do have a question, please type it into the box where this says questions on your screen, and we'll try to get to it. So the first question, um, and, and one I would definitely like to emphasize, the, sli the slides and presentation will be made available online. Uh, it will be at the page that says usa.childcareaware.org backslash webinars. Uh, you can find it there, the slides, and the link to the YouTube recording of this presentation. Oh, well, this is a great question. So we got our first question uh, in, and it's, what is the current status on implementation of the proposed changes to regulations released on, in, in May of 2013? So this is the interesting thing that happens when you have uh, federal rules or regulations introduced and a bill that does very similar things. Um, so a little bit background on the proposed regulations before I go into what's the current status. In May, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration for Children and Families, and the offices, the Office of Child Care, which is in those, released a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is more simply referred to as proposed rule, which did many of the similar changes that required comprehensive background checks, that changed the way training is done, requiring additional training measures, 
and require things like inspections and greater consumer education information. So what, what happened with that is in May, they opened it up for public comment. They opened it up for a 75-day public comment period, which then closed in August. Um, so since August, they've been working on you know, uh, pulling in the comments and making sure that they revise if they felt revisions were necessary. But with the movement of the bill, it seems there has been some hesitation to move forward until they figure out what's happening with the bill. Because once, if a bill is passed into law, they would have to write re regulations around how to implement the bill and provide guidance around that. So our belief is that the Department of Health and Human Services is waiting for greater uh, clarity around what's happening with Congress. If Congress is unable to pass a bill before uh, the end of this congressional session, the 113th, then it is likely that the Department of Health and Human Services would move forward with the proposed rule uh, and make it a final rule. So, so I hope that helps kind of clarify that. It's definitely a um, confusing process. But one thing I will note is that if a bill is passed into law, it is usually a little more um, complex and a much more difficult process to go back and repeal or change it, whereas a, federal, a proposed rule can be altered at any time by the administration or the next or future administration. Um, so I'm going to pick out some of the other questions. We, we actually have a great deal amount of questions, so hopefully we'll be able to get to a lot of them. Uh, does S-1086 require states to implement a QRIS, or is this still left up to states? So with the quality improvement dollars that are going to be required, 12% uh, aggregate between the 9% total for uh, states as well as the 3% for infant and toddlers, it encourages states to use that funding to implement a system of quality indicators, but it does not require states to implement a quality rating and improvement system. So states will have the flexibility to implement one or um, to build on it, but it will not require it explicitly. Um, so, so I hope that helps clarify that. It, it's something I know we've been getting from um, a, a lot of states. I, I think. Oh, th this is a great. Um, th this is a great. Great question. I, I've been asked to clarify around, you know, what we mean when we say family, friend, and neighbor care as far as licensing exemption goes. It really is just for those who are caring for their own family members or related children. If they are an unrelated neighbor or somebody who's receiving federal funds to care for their children, they would still have to come under um, the monitoring piece of it as well as go under some of it. Uh, once it's one or more unrelated children in their care. Uh, so, I, so I hope that that clears it up a little bit. Uh, another great ask for a resource is do we have a side-by-side -side analysis of S-1086, the current law, and the proposed regulations that can be shared? Absolutely. Uh, we have a great website, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm trying to um, make sure I direct you there in the most direct possible manner. We have a CCDBG reauthorization uh, web page. It, it, we hope it's your one-stop shop for all things about the program as well as all things about reauthorization and the proposed role uh, to hopefully clarify everything that's out there. Uh, if you go to our page at usa.childcareaware.org, you will see the public policy tab. Under that, you'll find core issues, and under that, you'll find CCDBG reauthorization, which has all of that, including a side-by-side -side analysis, as well as a summary of what's out there currently. And hopefully, uh, as we move forward, you'll be seeing more information. You know, we hope you'll pay, stay tuned to that and pay attention, because we're definitely going to be putting together a lot of resources that should really be helpful for helping you guys break down, you know, what's exactly um, going on. Well, this is another great question, and I think this is um, something that I think a lot of states are going to be dealing with. So somebody asked, recertification is required every six months. Should we change this to every 12 months? Um, so if you are in a state that currently requires it at six months and the bill does pass, you will have to expand that to a 12-month certification um, up to, pay, to, up to um, 12 months to make sure that families 
are at a period where the federally uh, it's consistent across the board. You could go beyond that 12 months and do 18 months or 24 months, but you know most states do 12 months currently. So when they were passing the bill, they thought that was a good starting point. Um, we, we have requests for the link to the website with directions to the reauthorization page. Uh, yeah, I can actually share that. And when you get your email, um, you should see a link in those follow-up emails to this webinar to our website with a link to that page. So we want to make sure you guys get that. And there's a link in this webinar. Uh, when we put it up to the um, when we put it up on the website, the slides as well as the uh, recording, you, we'll, we'll make sure there's a link in there that directs you directly to the um, to the link as well. And just, um, I'm also looking at, there's a couple of questions. Um, Nick uh, did address this, but just to clarify that um, license exempt providers are only affected um, to receive monitoring or an inspection if they are receiving federal funds, so if they're receiving CCDF funds um, in the new proposed bill. So there's a couple of questions around that. Um, and we'll pull up the link to our both our webinars page and our Child Care Development Block Grant page so you can see um, where exactly the webinar will live and also all the resources that Nick is referring to. Um, you can see where that one-stop shop is as well. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we can probably take a few more questions. Um, if you have questions, still get them in there, uh, because I think a lot of you may have similar questions. Is the funding increase based on discretionary funds, including the targeted, or excluding the targeted funding? It would be including the targeted funding. So um, that would be for total discretionary funding, and then the targeted funding would come out of that. Um, so it's, it's definitely, you know, a, a, a piece of it, but it's definitely not the entire uh, picture. So another great question we have, um, is there anything in CCDBG to prevent a state from requiring quality standards higher than health and safety? Could a city with its own licensing requirements do this, making licensing more strict or requiring enrollment in a state's QRIS, which is currently optional? I, th I think this is an absolutely important question and something that we hear a lot. And I want to be very clear that if passed, S1086 would provide a very bare bones minimum for what would be required for the federal from the federal government. State, counties, and cities would all be allowed to expand on top of that and have much more requirements as long as it doesn't contradict or conflict with the federal guidelines. So, for example, uh, in Virginia, there are three counties that actually have their own Office of Child Care and Office of Child Care Licensing, which have stricter standards for things like ch uh, child to staff ratios and training requirements and licensing requirements. So you can see that it's just providing that bare bottom baseline standards um, to make sure across the country we're protecting the uh, safety and health of children in child care. So I think we have time for um, one or two more um, questions. Uh, let's see, we, we have a lot, so I'm trying to make sure we get to some of the more uh, common ones. And also, if we don't um, answer your question, feel free to, or you, ha you want more clarification on any part of this um, webinar, uh, we will provide our emails at the end so um, we can make sure to follow up with you directly. I, I think this is a great uh, question, and it's about, you know, in, in the um, history of the block grant, has it been awarded to different institutions, you know, whether faith-based or whether um, community-based, or what, what type of, you know, uh, programs have received and how kind of does the funding stream go out to states and how does that work? So what, what's interesting about this is it is a block grant, which means the federal government funds, gives the funds directly to states, and states decide how they want to uh, spend the funds from there on out. So what that means is states decide whether or not it's provided to families to then have the choice to access different programs, or whether it's provided to um, programs to create open access to slots. 
This can be done through contracts, grants, or uh, vouchers, which is one of the more common ways to do it. Um, so, you know, really it, can, it has gone to religious-based or faith-based providers. It's also gone to community-based providers. It's also gone to school district-based providers. It really depends on how the state wants to go about uh, moving forward with it or how they currently do it now. And uh, none of these, uh, none of the changes in the federal legisla legislation or in any proposed rule will really affect the uh, systematic structure of the block grant and how that operates. So you wouldn't see a lot of uh, change in that. I think we have time for one more question, and we have a great question to end it. As Michelle said, if you didn't get um, your question answered, or if you thought of an additional question, or somebody else is watching it, or listening to it, or reviewing the slides and you have a question, please feel free to uh, reach out to Michelle and I. But all of our contact information is on the USA.ChildCareAware.org website. Please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us. So a great question to end with is when would the legislation take effect if passed? So if, as I said, there's a vote in November, uh, the day, if it is passed out of Congress in November, go to the president for his signature. Well, it would really depend how quickly or how slowly the president signs it. But as long as the president signs it before the start of a new congressional session, um, it would take place before the enactment of the bill would start to take place prior to January 1st of 2015. What that means is based on the timelines given in the bill, which is actually a, a uh, segue into what will be our fourth webinar, which talks a lot about, okay, when does the bill say this piece needs to be implemented by? Um, it all depends on what the bill says for different pieces. So states will probably start implementing it based around what, when um, the Department of Health and Human Services start providing guidance or releases final guidance around what needs to be implemented and when. Um, so it's really, you know, a, a fluid process until we get that final guidance from um, HHS. But at, at the earliest it will start, you know, soon, but could go a few years into the future by the time the different the bill requires different pieces to be implemented. So I, at this point, I would like to thank you for joining us. Um, our next webinar will actually take place this Thursday, and it's going to talk about what TAS 1086 means specifically for families and child care providers. So if you are a family receiving funds, or even if you're not, or if you're a provider receiving funds, or even if you're not, what effect could this have on you? And what could this mean very um, straightforward? Why do you need to know about this or what could uh, affect them? This webinar will help take you through some of the concerns and questions and comments we've had in the past. So once again, we would like to both thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned, the slides and the YouTube recording will both be online. Please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, if you'd like to register for the next webinar series, uh, you can go to usa.childcareaware.org backslash webinars for future webinars. And Michelle's pulling it up right here. So we'll leave you with this. Um, and we hope you have a great Tuesday. And we'll look forward to speaking with you on Thursday. Thank you very much.